Welcome to Penn Arts and Sciences sixth annual Penn Grad Talks. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Beth Wenger, and I'm the Associate Dean for Graduate Studies for the School of Arts and Sciences. Today is day three of our four day series of talks. Yesterday, we heard from students in the social sciences, and today we're turning to the natural sciences. At Penn, our natural and physical scientists seek new information and understanding of living organisms and natural objects through experiment, observation, and deduction. They are opening up new worlds of understanding about our environment, from what grows in the ground to things that soar above us in space. They will help diagnose and cure disease. They'll create clean energy and pioneer our understanding of the natural world. Our speakers today are Luella Allen Waller from biology, Nakul Deshpande from the Earth and Environmental Science Department, Hannah Rowenfans from chemistry, Sophie Silver from Earth and Environmental Science, and Orion Staples from the chemistry department. I encourage you to watch each of the five talks and click on the link below to cast your own vote for the Audience Choice Award. One winner across the four categories will receive a $500 prize. And we hope to see you back tomorrow for presentations from the professional master's programs at Penn LPS, the College of Liberal and Professional Studies. The full schedule and voting information and the previous talks can be found at sas.upenn.edu. And lastly, let me say thank you to our presenters for sharing their insights and helping to show the important part that our graduate students play in the intellectual life of our school. Please enjoy the talks. I know it's a gray day here in Philadelphia, but for a moment, imagine yourself under the sea with this clownfish and its anemone. Or is it an anemone and its clownfish? It's both, because these animals live together in what's called a symbiotic partnership. Today, I hope to convince you of the power and vulnerability of symbioses like this one. Symbiosis is a spectrum. We humans spend a lot of energy worrying about and avoiding kinds of symbionts that can harm us, things like pathogens and parasites. But at the other end of the spectrum, there are symbiotic arrangements that can benefit all parties. These are called mutualisms, like the clownfish that protects the anemone while the anemone feeds the clownfish. In mutualism, two completely different organisms invest in one another to become more than the sum of their parts. The corals that build tropical reefs are a perfect example. When you look at this picture, notice how clear that water is. That's because corals grow in really shallow, warm waters where there's actually very little nutrients or plankton for animals to eat. And yet coral reefs are some of the most productive ecosystems on Earth. They're home to around a quarter of ocean species, giving them the nickname the rainforests of the sea. This is due to corals, which are the literal bedrock of reefs. They build these complex structures that fish and other animals then flock to. And all this diversity has huge benefits for people, too. Reefs provide jobs in tourism and fishing and uh, protect our coastlines from dangerous storms and waves. They're also a promising source of a lot of novel pharmaceuticals. So how does all of this productivity and growth come when there are so few nutrients to work with? The answer all hinges on a really powerful mutualism. Corals may look just like rocks, but they're animals. Each colony is made of many small polyps, like little mouths, and each polyp is stuffed with millions of tiny dinoflagellates. These are microscopic algae that live inside of the coral cells. Here's the bargain. In exchange for a safe place to live and some trace nutrients from the coral animal, the dinoflagellates photosynthesize and spin tropical sunlight into sugar, most of which they then pass back to the coral host. Some corals get over 90% of the calories that they need from algal photosynthesis. But this nutrient trade is so delicately calibrated that it's really sensitive to environmental change. In particular, when it gets too hot, corals expel their algae in a stress response called coral bleaching. 
Without the colorful dinoflagellates, corals are just white. And without the nutrients that their symbiotic partner provides, bleached corals start to starve and are likely to die. Luckily, they don't always. But if a coral is going to recover, it has to get its symbionts back. As the dinoflagellates return and regrow throughout the colony, they bring color back until the colony is considered recovered, like this one here. But even though this process is absolutely crucial for reef survival in the future, we don't understand it all that well. So I was curious whether the bargain between corals and their symbiotic algae changes in the wake of coral bleaching as corals have to overcome this massive stress. To answer this question, I focused on understanding the transfer of sugar from the algae to the coral. I sampled corals and put them into heated tanks for a few weeks until they started to bleach. Then I removed the heaters, let the corals recover for about a month. My goal was to trace where the benefits of symbiosis ended up and to figure out whether everyone was getting their fair share of that photosynthetic sugar. So I added a special labeled carbon molecule that only the algae can absorb via photosynthesis and then pass along to the coral. Then I could analyze the amount of that special carbon molecule in the algae versus in the coral tissues to track who was getting how much sugar. I expected that corals with more algal symbionts should be getting more food from photosynthesis. But instead, I saw that corals with the most algae didn't necessarily get any more food. This was surprising because if you think of algae like farmers, they're the primary producers of this relationship. And you would think that more of those active farmers should mean more food for the coral to work with. Instead, bigger algal populations got more selfish. To figure out why corals with the most algae weren't benefiting more, I calculated a sort of algal profit margin of photosynthetic sugars. And I hope you can see that as algal density increases, so does that profit margin, but only for the algae. In other words, the algae that grew back the fastest after coral bleaching were still photosynthesizing and putting away plenty of sugar, but less of that sugar was ending up in the coral. I think this is because after bleaching causes algae to be expelled, some of the algae that remain have to invest less in cooperating with the mutualism in order to fuel their own regrowth, in order to power that coral recovery. In sum, I found evidence that coral symbionts shift along this symbiosis spectrum from mutualism towards parasitism in the aftermath of coral bleaching. And this is really bad for corals because it means that the bleaching recovery process is intrinsically stressful. The corals essentially have to support a deadbeat symbiont population for a little while while they recover. But even this suboptimal arrangement could have worked in the past. When bleaching events were rare, corals could probably afford to handle a temporary parasite while their symbiont population rebounded until it could contribute productively again to the coalition. Unfortunately though, the oceans are getting hotter and corals can't afford to be giving these loans. They are bleaching more often and this bleach recovery cycle is getting harder for them to bear. Now that we know that symbiosis recovery is itself stressful to the coral, climate change is more than ever an existential threat to coral reefs. I do get some hope from the fact that algal strategies are dynamic. It means that this mutualism can respond to environmental change and can actively shift the way that it uses energy in response to novel stress. I think the real question right now is, can we match that adaptability? Are we humans willing to change how we use energy and what we invest in, in the face of global climate change? I'm searching for what may help corals overcome this unprecedented challenge. Hopefully biologists and conservationists can figure out how to keep reef ecosystems alive long enough for us to decarbonize and curb climate change together. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Nakul, and I'm here today to tell you a story. The story is called The Perpetual, uh, 
the perpetual fragility of creeping hill slopes. This is a story about a sand pile. You can see a sand pile being poured here as grains rain from the top, the free service avalanches, and we can see what looks kind of like a fluid. But this sand pile is more than just a pile of sand. It's a tool for understanding the physics of how soil moves on hill slopes in nature. The world around us isn't as solid as we think it is. This is a, an example of a landslide in Brazil. Portions of this landslide appear solid, but at other times it feels like a liquid. You can see here that the soil almost looks like waves bashing against a pier. Landslides like this aren't unique. They happen all around the world to great costs for both human life um, and to infrastructure. It's pretty obvious when landslides happen in landscapes. They leave telltale scars, then we can tell where flow has happened. But there are many landscapes where there are no evidence of landsliding at all. And geologists for a long time have intuited that there is a flow called creep that happens on landscapes like this over millennia. But the exact mechanisms of creep are unknown, it's ambiguous, and it hasn't been ever observed directly. So I'm gonna ask a simple question. Is what is the minimum number of ingredients that you need to manifest flow? And to do that, I'm going to uh, conduct an experiment. The experiment is pretty simple. I just pour a pile of sand on a table. The, the pile is enclosed between two plexiglass blocks. We illuminate the system with a laser. We want to be very, very sensitive to the motions that we can measure. So this laser generates a speckle pattern. And this speckle pattern allows us to access very, very tiny grain motions. To give you an idea of the magnitude of these grain motions, think a billionth of a meter. This is a fraction of the width of hair in your head. And this is an example on the top right here. You see uh, grains being poured into the system. The grains are illuminated by LED light. And beneath here, you can see the texture of the speckle pattern and the pile being formed by a series of successive avalanches. Um, once the grains are done being poured, this is when we begin to observe. I should mention that the system is sitting on a vibration isolating table in a basement across the street. This is about as quiet of an environment as we can get. And once the final grain is done being poured into the system, this looks like nothing is happening, right? But in fact, the sand pile is moving. It's alive and seizing with motion. In a picture that's just as dynamic as the landslide video that I showed you before. There are little popcorns of deformation that blimp in and out of existence amidst a sea of motion. So this may disturb you, certainly disturbs me. A pile of sand just sitting on a table doing something that nobody would expect. And a natural question that you could ask is, okay, does this go on forever? I don't have an answer for that. That's a mystery. But um, go on a little uh, a diversion with me, a little side quest, and consider the darkness of space, OK? Space is even more quiet of an environment than the basement across the street. And in space, there are comets and meteors that are basically big piles of sand. This is a picture from a meteor. And what we can see is around the corner here, there's sun peeking around here. And that sun tells us something pretty important, but pretty simple, and is that heat is the most ubiquitous form of mechanical disturbance in the universe. You can't escape heat, right? And this inspires us to ask the question, well, what if we tickle our sand pile a little bit with some heat? And to do that, we introduce a sinusoidal signal. This is a modest temperature change, up and down with time. And the sand pile responds by breathing in lockstep with the temperature cycles. So what does this tell us? It tells us that the, the answer to the question, does creep go on forever, is kind of a moot point. Because even in the deep recesses of space, there's heat which allows creep to, to continue. The second thing that it tells us is that uh, the sand pile is exquisitely sensitive to mechanical disturbances. In this way, it is fragile. This fragility now, combined with this view of creep, uh, allows us to, to reconsider disturbances in nature that lead to landslides. So consider that the small earthquake that does not lead to a landslide or a very tiny rainfall. With this new view of creep, there is an entire region beneath our perception where weak disturbances and creep play with each other. And there is a hint that the interaction between creep and weak mechanical disturbances hold the key for predicting when and where failures like this will happen. So if I leave you with anything today, I hope you look at the world around you with new eyes and you consider even the most humble patch of dirt as not something that is static, but rather that is something that is alive and beautiful. And when you look at a hill or you're contemplating a gentle landscape, th there is beautiful uh, creep that is happening beneath our perception. If you'd like to know more, you can check out this paper. Um, it is entitled the same thing as the talk, Perpetual Cre Fragility of Creeping Hill Slopes. 
And also you can read this uh, paper by Adam Mann, this piece by Adam Mann, which gives you a sense of the larger scientific context of this work. Thanks for your attention. I am obsessed with essential oils. Essential oils are comprised of the many chemicals inside of roots, bark, seeds, and flowers of plants. They can be obtained through distillation, extraction, or cold pressing. And they're commonly marketed for aromatherapy, topical use, and ingestion by companies like Young Living and doTERRA International. This is the Essential Oils Desk Reference, an 820-page guide written by Young Living founder Gary Young. It contains a personal usage guide, which gives directions on how to use essential oils against ADHD, Alzheimer's, autism, bacterial infections, cancer, Parkinson's, and viral infections, among many others. As one Young Living consultant said, viruses, including Ebola, are no match for Young Living essential oils. This is absolute nonsense. When I say that I'm obsessed with essential oils, I mean that in the sense that one might be horrified or fascinated by a train wreck. Gary Young and experts like him tout essential oils as a substitute for medicine, but none of the oils in his book have been FDA approved for the treatments of any disease, and comprehensive research on their effects hasn't been performed. What is particularly insidious about the idea that essential oils can be used as medicine is that real science is interwoven with incredibly fraudulent claims like these. Scientists frequently turn to nature as a potential source for new drugs because plants, like humans, face biological threats. When I'm sick, I can go to the hospital or a pharmacy and get medicine, but plants have to mount all of their own defenses. And so they synthesize thousands of molecules with real biological impacts. And the FDA has approved over 50 natural products for medicinal use. Some of them you've likely heard of, like caffeine, nicotine, and CBD. But others may be less familiar to you. In the organic chemistry community, Taxol is the most famous natural product. It was originally isolated from the Pacific U in 1971 and later FDA approved as a treatment for ovarian and breast cancers. Salicylic acid was isolated from willow bark in 1838 and can still be found in skincare and cosmetic products today. By making a small change to the structure of salicylic acid, chemists were first able to synthesize aspirin. When scientists edit a molecule found in nature, we say that the new compound is derived from the old one. So for example, aspirin is a derivative of salicylic acid. As a final example, the opioid morphine was originally isolated from poppy flowers, and there are many derivatives of it, including heroin, fentanyl, and oxycodone. But there are two derivatives that I find particularly interesting. Naltrexone is a smoking secession aid originally FDA approved in 1984, and naloxone, also known as Narcan, is an absolute miracle drug, capable of reversing the effects of opioid use and preventing thousands of overdose deaths since its FDA approval in 1971. The structures of naltrexone, morphine, and naloxone are incredibly similar. In chemistry, form directs function, so small changes to a molecule can have enormous impact. Not all natural products are immediate winners, though. For centuries, magnolia bark has been used for a variety of ailments, including treating gingivitis and preventing cavities. In 1982, scientists in Japan determined that one of the active ingredients in this bark was hinoki oil. They tested it in a laboratory and found that hinoki oil was in fact capable of inhibiting cavity-causing bacteria. Unfortunately, in 2018, our research group reported that while it was capable of inhibiting bacteria in a laboratory, it was far less effective under conditions closer to those of a human mouth. That's pretty common in the world of drug discovery. Results in a laboratory don't necessarily mean results in the real world. But just because nature couldn't make an effective antibiotic doesn't mean that we can't. In the past five years, we've taken all that we've learned from inoculol and used it to make dozens of new molecules. And if all of these compounds look kind of similar to you, it's because they are. 
We performed a structure activity relationship study to systematically explore how the structure of a molecule can change its activity. By modifying a molecule's size and shape, we can figure out how it works and build compounds that do their jobs more efficiently. It's like cracking a safe with a combination lock. Each digit contributes to cracking the code. And so we broke Hinocoil up into sections and modified each part. And we tested these new compounds against bacteria and used all the features that were most active to create a better molecule. We made so many compounds that improved upon Hinocoil, but I'll share with you two of my favorites. I work with a variety of bacteria, but the one that you've most likely heard of is methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, or MRSA, a multi-drug resistant bacteria that can cause severe skin infections. HFR-198 is six times more effective than Hinocoil at inhibiting MRSA. It works about as well as medication commonly prescribed to patients infected with the bacteria. Another molecule I synthesized, HFR-349, is only about 1.4 times as effective as Hinocoil when it comes to inhibiting MRSA, but it inhibits several bacteria that Hinocoil has no effect on. There are two major classes of bacteria, gram-negative and gram-positive. Gram-negative bacteria have two cell membranes, and so they are experts at evading antibiotic treatment because it is very difficult to penetrate these membranes. Hinocchio failed to inhibit any of the compound or any of the gram-negative bacteria I tested it against, but HFR-349 inhibited three, including bacteria that are responsible for causing wounds or for infecting wounds in combat hospitals, E. coli, a common source of foodborne illness, and V. cholerae, the bacterium responsible for cholera. We're still working on finding the perfect antibiotic. But our results so far make us hopeful that these compounds could one day save lives. This is the story of a single natural product from a single plant. But there are hundreds of stories just like this one. Chemists around the world dedicate their careers to identifying compounds found in plants, examining their biological effects, and trying to figure out how that information can be used to improve our lives. Unfortunately, companies selling essential oils are a part of a predatory industry and have been instrumental in the rise of anti-science and anti-vaccine movements. But I don't think essential oils need to be held in opposition to drug discovery or modern medicine. Many companies offer magnolia oil, and that product often contains Hinocchio oil. Plants and essential oils aren't a magic bullet, but they are an incredible resource for scientists searching for new medications. And organic chemistry is a valuable tool with which we can improve upon the work of nature. While developing these compounds, I didn't see myself in competition with Mother Nature. Rather, she was my greatest collaborator. Thank you. So, have you ever stopped to take a look at a thin, dry layer of paint and the way that it cracks and splinters in really interesting ways? What about the frozen surface of a lake, shattered and broken up into individual polygons? These cracking patterns are pretty common here on Earth. They exist at a wide variety of scales and can be found within a wide variety of materials. However, that's not to say that they only exist on Earth. They also exist across our solar system, on the surface of planets and moons alike. These images are some of the only resources we have to study these distant bodies, since we can't go there. <laughs> so how can we take these images and use them to understand the processes occurring on the surfaces here? It's actually simpler than you think. So there are only two ways in which regular polygons can perfectly tessellate to fill space without creating any gaps, and that is with squares or with hexagons. We can use these geometries to understand the forces at play that are creating these patterns. When we see squares, we understand it to mean that there's been some sort of compression or squeezing of the material. And when we see hexagons, we know that there's been some sort of tension or pulling on the material. Now you may be thinking, well, we don't see a lot of perfect squares and perfect hexagons in real life. Right, how then can we say that these are re regular polygons? Well, it turns out that the cracks created by these fracture networks form what can be very well approximated as regular polygons, so much so that their shape can be quantified with just two variables, 
nodal degree, or n, which is a measure of the number of corners for a given junction in our network, and vertex degree, or v, which is a measure of the number of corners in a given cell. For example, a T-shaped junction has nodal degree equal to 2, because there are two corners that meet at that junction. And a square has a vertex degree of 4, because it has four corners. So P here is a ratio of the number of T-shaped junctions, or n equals 2, to the total number of junctions. And this gives us a feel for how regular the network is. We can apply this framework to these fracture network patterns we see on other planets to better understand how these patterns were formed, as well as potentially how many times they've been broken without ever setting foot on these distant surfaces. Now I'm going to take you on a brief tour of our solar system through the lens of these cracked patterns to better understand how truly ubiquitous they are. We're going to start here on Venus. Here is one of the networks that we isolated on Venus. If we take a look at our plot on the left-hand side, on our x-axis, we have the nodal degree, which again is the number of corners per uh, junction in the network. And on the y-axis, we have our vertex degree, which again is the number of corners per cell. These two values are averaged over the entire network and plotted as a pair. Up here at the top, we have our regular hexagons. And along this line at the center, we have our regular squares. And here is where this particular network plots in relation to our regular polygons. Now let's take a look at Mars. Here's the fracture network that we isolated on Mars. And here is where that network plots in relation to our regular polygons. Now, let's look at Europa. Europa is a moon of Jupiter. And as you can see just from the surface alone, it is highly broken up. When you zoom in, here is the network we took a look at. And here is where it plots in relation to our regular polygons. Now, last but not least, poor little Pluto, all the way out on the edge of the solar system, no longer a planet, but still very important for our understanding of these cracks. So here is one of the surfaces we looked at on Pluto. And here is where Pluto plots in relation to our regular polygons. Now, you may be thinking, if these are well approximated as regular polygons, why don't they, why don't they plot where our regular polygons are? Well, that has to do with trajectories. So as you can imagine, once these fractures form, they're not going to stay that way forever. It's likely that they'll be broken again and again. And as these changes occur to this network, we can track changes in the nodal degree and vertex degree, n and v, with each successive breaking or changing of the network. Work done by Goering et al. in 2014 shows us that when you have a square network and you repeatedly wet it and dry it, on average, you will tend towards a hexagonal pattern with each repeated wetting and drying, following along this yellow arrow here. Work done by Demokos et al. in 2020 shows us that an existing pattern of crisscrossing fractures, when you break the cells up and you break them in half, you drive the system along this green trajectory here, which starts out as a kind of graph paper pattern, will eventually become a more brick-shaped pattern with repeated breaking. Now, let's go back to our planetary data. So, as you can see, we have kind of three patterns that set the bounds on our plot. Over here on the left-hand side, we have our regular squares that form brick-shaped patterns. At the top, we have our regular hexagons, which are kind of akin to honeycomb. And over on the right, we have our grid-shaped pattern of regular squares. Now, as you can probably tell, the majority of these planetary surfaces are plotting very close to this brick pattern, as opposed to our hexagons or uh, graph paper pattern. Now, why is that? Well, the absence of graph paper pattern has to do with the trajectories mentioned prior. So with the re repeated breaking in half of these initial grid-shaped patterns, you're driving the system to look more and more like bricks with each repeated instance of breaking. You can imagine that as these cracks sit exposed on the surface for longer periods of time, you're going to end up with more brick-shaped patterns on average than grid-shaped patterns. Now, what about the honeycomb pattern? Where is it? Well, this is Giant's Causeway in Ireland. Now, you would be very hard-pressed to find cracks like this in the Wissahickon. Why? Well, this required uh, conditions to form these particular networks are very, very specific. And any small deviation from the required conditions will cause a totally different shape to form. If you were to quantify all of the fracture networks that we have here on Earth and create a pie chart, there would be a very small sliver that would make up networks like this one. Now, imagine taking that and extrapolating out to the solar system. <laughs> a problem emerges. 
Finding these hexagons is like finding a needle in a haystack. However, that's not to say that there's no needle. And as we continue to comb the solar system for more of these fractures, we plan to populate this graph on our ever shifting journey of understanding worlds beyond our own. Thank you. Today, I'm gonna to tell a story about a lesser known greenhouse gas known as methane. Now, like me, many of you might be enjoying the really warm weather we're having in February. Unfortunately, there's some pretty disastrous effects of climate change, including ravenous forest fires, droughts in places there were never droughts, flooding right here in Philadelphia, superstorms on massive scales, the melting of the polar ice caps, and then food scarcity not only for animals, but for people as well. And so all of these are really a symptom of the rising CO2 levels in the atmosphere, which is a direct correlation from the burning of petroleum for energy. As you can see, our current level of CO2 is nearly double what it was just 70 years ago. Even more troubling is if we look 20 years in the future. What's detailed here is called the production gap. And I want you to pay attention to the purple line and the red line. The purple line shows the maximum amount of carbon dioxide that us as a society can produce over the next 20 years in order to keep the planet warming by only one and a half degrees Celsius, which as you can see is already having pretty drastic effects. The red line, on the other hand, are countries' current plans and projections to produce CO2, and it's 190% higher than it must be in order to keep the planet from only slowly warming. Now, if fossil fuels and burning fossil fuels are killing the planet, why are we continuing to do that? In order to show you that, I'm gonna bring you to another graph where we look 30 years into the future and at the current global energy landscape. You can see that other renewable sources of energy, such as liquid, uh, such as, uh, Wind and solar are projected to become a part of our energy landscape. Unfortunately, petroleum and natural gas, both of which are fossil fuels, are projected to be a significantly larger portion. And why is this? And the answer is really quite simple, is that petroleum is very easy to use. You can take it out of the ground, you can put it into your car, and it's a liquid. It transports long distances, and it comes out of the ground as nice little packet, packeted bits of energy. On the other hand, natural gas shows promise for this sort of thing, but unfortunately, natural gas is a gas, and so it's very challenging to move long distances. Now, what is natural gas? Natural gas is comprised approximately 70% of a molecule known as methane, shown here. It's the simplest hydrocarbon, and it's a carbon atom bonded to four hydrogen atoms. In addition to being a gas, methane is extremely chemically unreactive which means in order to transform methane into more useful compounds, it requires significant amounts of energy and very large scale industrial plants like this, which are bad for the environment. And they're extremely expensive. So all of those really pale in comparison to why methane is so bad. Methane is so bad because it's actually approximately 80 times more potent than carbon dioxide at warming the planet. And so to give you kind of a uh, picture of what this looks like, there's a map of light pollution in the United States. And you can see light pollution coming from areas you would expect, right? Major metropolitan areas, New York, Philly, Chicago. But then there's also light pollution up here in North Dakota, where there's no real major metropolitan areas. And this is coming from what's known as the Bakken oil field. And this is a picture of what is contributing to all of that light. It's essentially the burning of methane to make carbon dioxide. And why do we do that? So we do that because, like I said, methane is a gas. It's very hard to transport long distances from, from where it is up in the oil fields. It's extremely chemically unreactive, and so it's very challenging to do anything with it. Not only that, it escapes into the atmosphere quite readily. And since it's 80 times more potent, burning, the unproductive burning of methane to carbon dioxide actually represents 
pretty much the only option that a lot of people are faced at these petroleum refineries. But that's where I come in as a chemist. We want to be able to take methane, which has a lot of potential, and turn it into something that we can actually use productively and help curb this release of greenhouse gas. Now, so I'll take you on a little story down a reaction of methane. So like I said, methane is very challenging to react, but it is possible to get it to react selectively to certain products. Shown here is methanol, which is a liquid fuel, as well as chemical precursor. Unfortunately, because methane is challenging to react, the conditions required to take methane to methanol often bring methane all the way to carbon dioxide. This is a lot like if I, if I was at the top of a very steep hill in a wagon with no brakes, and I was expecting myself to stop halfway down. I would just really go all the way to the end, and in this case, even way off the hill. So you might be saying, well, can't we just come back from carbon dioxide? And we kind of can. Unfortunately, that wastes a significant amount of energy, right? Methane is all the way up here, carbon dioxide is all the way down here. And so this indicates that carbon dioxide is much more stable. Methane has much more potential energy. On the other hand, we have um, industrial processes that are capable of taking carbon dioxide plus hydrogen back up to methanol. Unfortunately, that's extremely challenging, and it's a lot like me riding a bike up a hill in 80 degree weather. Now, my job as a chemist is to come in and figure out how I can vary this landscape. So I've made two variations in my work. The first is changing oxygen to some X2 compound. In this case, it's a boron compound. The second change is using and developing what's known as a catalyst. And so a catalyst is a compound that you add in very small amounts to the reaction mixture that allow reactions that would otherwise not happen occur, as well as help to control where the reaction ends up. And so that's basically akin to me being on top of the hill now on a bike with brakes. That's this change, the X2. The other change, you can see how I've lowered this energy from red to green and then raised this energy. That is helped to, that is controlled by the catalyst. And what this does is it allows me to generate a single liquid product from methane under relatively mild conditions. And now this uh, represents a significant advancement toward the ability to use methane productively and provides a method for sequestering an incredibly dangerous and potent greenhouse gas, methane. Thank you.